Um, okay. Um, all right, so yeah, like I said, so we're, we'll be going over now uh, the essay by Max Horkheimer, Traditional and Critical Theory. So Horkheimer is an important thinker, uh, obviously, as all the people are in this class, um, although he's really the one who, you know, essentially coins the term critical theory. That's really where the term comes from. Um, we are now really turning now, really uh, for the first time, um, to the group of, of, of people I mentioned in the syllabus, um, the Frankfurt School. And Horkheimer was in many ways kind of the leader of, of this group. He was essentially the director of the you know, organization to which they belonged, which was formerly known as the Institute for Social Research. Uh, but it was located in Frankfurt, uh, you know, the city in Germany. Um, uh, although for a very short period, a period of time before they actually had to relocate uh, first to Geneva, Switzerland, and then uh, eventually setting, settling in New York City for a period of time. And of course, this was obviously due to the takeover of Germany uh, by the Nazi party in the 1930s. So their, their sort of career, their, their history as thinkers really sort of play out against this very interesting backdrop of the rise of fascism in Germany, uh, their exile from Germany, their, their move to, to the United States, uh, you know, going through, you know, World War II, although, you know, not directly impacted by it as they were able to, you know, escape from it, but certainly, you know, plays a very big role in their, in their you, know, uh, um, you know, point of view on society. Um, so Horkheimer, as it says here, is actually born 1895, um, you know, I meant to mention this last class when we were talking about Lukash, who was about, you know, 10 years old. He was born in 1885, actually. But I think that that has a, a, a lot to do with, with, with their preoccupation with culture. In fact, if I could, you know, if I could describe critical theory using one sentence, I would, would probably say it's, it's sort of the, the Marxist analysis of culture, the Marxist analysis of mass culture, at least or culture in a general sense of knowledge and, and values, um, you know, the predominant values of society. And I think their preoccupation with culture really stems from the fact that if you look at their, you know, how their lives played out, um, these were people who were, you know, when they were younger, um, you know, lived in a world where you still had, you know, horse-drawn horse, horse -drawn carriages and, and things like that. And, and, and the mass media, as we understand it today, didn't really exist back then, or if it did, it very in its very sort of earliest phases of development. Um, that's probably one of the reasons why you know Marx himself, even though it's very much a kind of an, you know Marxist analysis and uh, analysis based on you know Marxian ideas. Uh, you know, Marx himself did not talk that much about about culture. He did talk about things like ideology, which is very important. You know, the 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 ruling ideas he says of any society or are, are the are the ideology of the ruling class. But in Marx's day, I mean, what kind of mass media really existed? I mean, not much. You had newspapers and the telegraph, basically. You know, Marx may have lived, you know, in, in his later years to see, see the very earliest developments of electricity. Um, although I think, you know, most cities probably would have had, you know, gas, gas powered lights uh, during his day. Uh, may have seen the very earliest developments of the telephone and things like that. But, you know, the, the, the sort of modern aspects of technology, which, of course, is what really makes the mass media possible in the first place, didn't really exist during his day. But these people, people like Horkheimer and Lukash and, and the various other people, they would have lived long enough to see these things come into being, although would have been also old enough to remember a time when these things didn't really exist. Um, again, you, you know, even things like, you know, automobiles would have been in their very earliest, you know, development. I think the first automobiles really start rolling, you know, coming out or around like the 1890s, but obviously would significantly evolve uh, in the decades following that. Uh, movies were really sort of beginning to come into being at this time, you know, it, also in the 1890s. 
um, at least, in, in, you know, in, in, in the sense that, you know, people would sort of sit in a room and kind of have a, a collective experience seeing a movie rather than, uh, you know, prior to that, you had these little like eyepiece things that people could look into and, and see so-called moving pictures. Um, but of course, you know, movies, of course, would significantly evolve as well. You didn't even have uh, sound in movies basically until the late 1920s. Uh, radio didn't really come about until the 1920s. Television obviously comes about, you know, later, later than that. So um, again, you know, they would have been old enough to, you know, have an experience of the world without these things being in them, but also have lived long enough to basically see all these things come into being, or at least, you know, develop to a significant amount. Even I think, right, the earliest computers were even, you know, coming out by the, by, by the 1970s. And I think even before then, I'm, I'm not so quite clear on the whole history of computers. Don't, don't some computers even go back to like the 1940s, like the various earliest, uh, models, you know, which were these big, you know, like massive things that would, you know, you know, basically fill up an, an entire room. Um, so they would have seen all these things, you know, and I, I think that that's certainly, you know, and, and I've often tried to think like what must have been like to like experience the world in that way. It must be kind of mind blowing, you know, to like, you know, grow up in a world where, you know, again, you know, you have horses pulling, pulling carriages around and during your lifetime, you see, you know, the Ford Mustang or something like that, or you see, you know, uh, sound pictures in color and things like that, or you see people, you know, watching TV and, you know, all the, all these, all these other things. It, it, it must've been quite, you know, an experience to see these things come into being, not necessarily for, you know, the positive either. I mean, I mean, you know, most of these people have a fairly, you know, pessimistic view of society. Um, so they did not necessarily see these things as necessarily, you know, developments, uh, you know, for the better. But I think it did, you know, significantly impact their, their view of the world. So anyway, so the essay that we'll be looking at is, is the essay, A Traditional and Critical Theory, which is actually written in the late 1930s, 1937, as it says here. Uh, the book in which it is collected in, though, was not published uh, in German until the late 1960s. It was not published in English until the early 1970s. And that kind of gives you a sense of the very delayed reception of these thinkers' ideas into sort of the you know, larger mainstream, particularly, of course, in the English-speaking world, but even in Germany. Um, you know, and, and, and I'll, I'll pretty much, you know, from now on, just refer to them as the Frankfurt School. Um, you know, I think they're, they're certainly still relevant now, um, but, uh, um, you know, I think there was very much a, a delayed re reception of their ideas for various reasons. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the war. I mean, these, these, these were German intellectuals who basically flee Germany in, in, in the 1930s. Uh, nobody is, you know, obviously reading their stuff in Germany dur during this period of time, not, not, not till after the war. Uh, they come to the United States, most of them. Um, they make the self-conscious choice uh, to write and publish in German, uh, which very much, you know, kind of delays their reception. You know, they're, they're very, for the most part, pretty much, you know, unknown figures in the, in the, in the United States dur during this period of time. Um, and I think, you know, it really wasn't until pretty much to, to the late 1960s, 1970s, where these ideas really started to become you know, gain, gain, gain traction and gain more exposure. So, you know, keep that in mind. There, there, there's almost always like, like a 30 to 40 year lag in between, you know, the, the writing and publication of these essays and when they actually began to have sort of an impact upon, uh, you know, like the larger culture. Which I guess in, in some ways makes them a little, a little more relevant, at least, you know, pushes them ahead, uh, you know, 30 to 40 years or so. Um, anyway. So again, Horkheimer was director of the Institute for Social Research, which is kind of the, the formal name of the Frankfurt School. Uh, it was founded in 1924. Um, Horkheimer was not the first director of the Institute, um, but it's really under his leadership, under his directorship, that, that, that the Institute basically gains the reputation that it has today, or what we you know, basically associate with the Frankfurt School, which again is kind of this Marxist approach to culture, um, an interdisciplinary approach, which I've already mentioned, you know, combines different fields of knowledge and different aspects of knowledge uh, 
Um, it was, you know, a, a true research institute. They, they, they did embark upon, you know, research, you know, sort of collective large scale research projects. Um, they were, you know, very much interrupted though, of course, by again, the Nazi takeover of power. Um, so the Institute was founded, like I said, in 1924. Um, originally, you know, uh, for its first, you know, six or seven years, it is um, more or less in a more sort of traditional Marxist frame of, you know, focusing on political economy, focusing on more, you know, economic based issues. Um, um, Horkheimer, uh, again, becomes the director in 1931 or late 1930, and, you know, kind of marks a change in course in, in the orientation of, of this institute. Uh, now, again, now, you know, Hitler comes into power in 1933. So in, in a very short period of time, um, again, the, the, the activities of this institute are basically interrupted by, by, the, by the Nazi takeover. Um, which uh, very much disrupts their activities. Their 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 building is is in fact seized by the Gestapo, the the you know the secret police of Germany. Um, and various members go through you know various different routes of escape. Uh, you know, Horkheimer goes to Geneva, Switzerland for a year or so, or maybe less than a year, and then like I said, basically comes to New York City in 1934. So once there, they actually become affiliated with Columbia. Uh, University, a very obviously well-known um, school here. Um, again, from what I can tell, from everything I've ever read, they 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 did not exactly you know fit in well. They 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 were not exactly what you consider to be well assimilated, um, and very were very much at odds with the sort of the dominant trends in American you know intellectual and academic life. At, you know, during that period of time, which which does factor into a lot into what you know Horkheimer's uh, you know essay is about, as 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 well, you know, as he tries to distance himself from what he calls traditional theory. Um, so, another important writing by Horkheimer, and, and and he has many, of course, but but his inaugural lecture, basically his sort of you know statement, basically saying what he's going to do or or what direction he's going to take the institute in, uh, known as as it says here. The present situation of social philosophy and, and the task of the Institute for Social Research uh, from 1931 is also very important. And here he really sort of lays out his, uh, his vision for what the Institute is going to become, which again is a sort of inter, interdisciplinary uh, you know, research institute with a particular sort of emphasis on, on culture. And, and of course, you know, taking a very sort of you know, critical view of society, which of course, hence the term critical theory. Um, it's also, you know, very much worth pointing out that 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 their version of Marxism, you know, increasingly becomes an academic affair rather than a movement of the working class as 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 a whole, which to some extent has always been a problem with Marxism. I mean, Marx himself was, you know, often spoke of great frustration, of course, in reading, you know, in 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 reaching working class people, although. Uh, you, you know, particularly in Europe, you know, many working class people did eventually come around to Marxism and did read, read a lot of his work. Um, and, and Marx did have some, some success a, 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 as an organizer and, you know, and basically somebody who was not just an academic, uh, re really was not an academic at all, but I mean, very much lived on the margins of, margins of society, um, but did have some success as, you know, an organizer and basically someone, you know, pursuing a, a kind of, you know, revolutionary, you know, political political project. Although obviously, uh, you know, it was after Marx's death where, where, where these ideas would, would take hold on, on an even much, much larger scale. Um, with people like Horkheimer and the, uh, the other members of the Frankfurt School, they are very much academic. They very much come out of the upper middle classes. Although again, this is something that, that, that you really see, you know, it is kind of an, a, a strange tendency or somewhat of a paradoxical thing that, that, that you see in, in the history of, of Marxism, and that many of the most important so-called Marxists do come from a, a, a kind of, you know, middle class to maybe you could even say upper middle class background. That's certainly true of the Frankfurt School. That's true of Lukash, for that matter, who, who, whose father actually was a, a successful banker in Budapest, in Hungary. Um, Marx kind of comes out of a middle class background, although, like I said, you know, in his adult life, I, uh, you know, very much sort of exists on the margins of society, 
the stories of sort of, uh, you know, economic, you know, suffering that he, he and his family endured during his lifetime are, are, are actually pretty, pretty well known. Um, so he did not live a, you know, comfortable life throughout his, his, his entire life. Uh, but did sort of come out of that upper class back, or, you know, middle class background himself. Uh, Friedrich Engels, uh, his father was a manufacturer. He was actually a capitalist, you know, and essentially inherited the, fa the family business. Um, and, and Engels him, himself for a period of time, you know, supported Marx financially. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting to think in a, you know, indirect way. I mean, I mean, capitalist enterprise was actually financing Marxism. So this has always been an aspect of Marxism, uh, but it becomes much more, you know, pronounced. I mean, I mean, Marx and Engels, for whatever else you can say about them, certainly were very much political people and very much, you know, involved in working class politics, involved and played a very big role in developing a, you know, organized political working class movement of people. With the Frankfurt School and with people like that from then on, it, it does very much become kind of an academic thing in that, in that these are people who very much are not connected to working class movements. Uh, that's, that's kind of why I emphasize that about Lukash, is that Lukash does still talk a lot about the proletariat. Um, and I think, you know, frankly, as I've gotten older, I, you know, I, I, I've, I've come to appreciate that aspect of Lukash even more and that he does have this kind of, you know, philosophical sophistication, the sort of, you know, intellectual sophistication that you associate with the Frankfurt School, but still, you know, maintains a commitment to working class politics. Whereas the Frankfurt School, even by the late 1930s, increasingly, and, and, and certainly by the 1940s, increasingly become more and more pessimistic about the chances for real social change and really become very much, uh, you know, uh, ambivalent, maybe is putting it nicely towards the proletariat, towards the working class, to the extent in which they, they essentially write off the working class as, as a, 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 a movement for social change. It is kind of a strange thing to be a Marxist and not put the proletariat, you know, on center stage is kind of like the most important thing, but that's kind of where they, where they go. And going forward, if I can sort of, you know, telegraph a little bit where, where we're going here in this class. You know, who are the people that actually read these things today? Who, who are the people that actually read the Frankfurt School and things like that? It's, it's the people, you know, it's the kind of, you know, upper class, you know, upper middle class people that read, you know, the New Yorker magazine and the New York review of books and things like that. And, and I, I, I got to say, I mean, I, I, I think to, to a large extent, you know, Marxism in, in, in their hands does become somewhat, somewhat sterile. It becomes very, you know, much just a thing that you talk about at cocktail parties, basically, and doesn't have any real um, political importance anymore. Um, and it's not to say that that the Frankfurt School represent, you know, all of Marxism, or or, or, or that they, you know, they they you know represent the direction that Marxism as a whole goes in. There are various different sort of trajectories that different movements go into, and some movements do stay more within a sort of working class frame. But again, the direction that the Frankfurt School goes, and they do become a very sort of important tendency or, or a very important, um, you know, aspect of Marxism, they very much go this, this kind of academic route to the point today where, you know, again, the most people who even read this stuff or even aware of this stuff are, uh, you know, again, sort of upper middle class people who go to, you know, cocktail parties and stuff and kind of talk about these things, or they write, you know, if, if you read, you know, book reviews and film reviews and stuff like that, I mean, they, they, they love talking about themes of alienation and modern culture and de dehumanization and things like that. But where, do, where does it really go? I mean, and, and again, this is something we'll, we'll turn to more, you know, especially later on in the semester. But I think it's, you know, maybe at least worth talking a little bit about now. I mean, where does that really go? I mean, I mean, and, and I, I, I guess you could say, you know, it's not really all all that impressive, the kind of political instincts or political judgments of, of this, you know, sort of class of people, this sort of social milieu, as, as they call it. Uh, the same people that read, yeah, Kyan, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, it's funny because, like, you talked about They Live and um, how in film there's so much critique, um, yet, you know, um, they talk about it while, um, you know, living and um, enjoying the privilege uh, privileges of capitalism. It's like 
it's like very postmodern. I don't know. It's like, um, yeah. Well, yeah. Po- po- postmodern is, is something that sort of comes out of this as well. Um, yeah, I, I mean, a movie like They Live was, you know, not not a very, I guess, popular movie. You know, it's it's. I mean, it's not- but there's like recent stuff, like um, even like uh, I think uh, have you seen Sorry to Bother You? No, I've heard of it though. Okay, yeah, I mean, Boots Rowley, uh, the director, he's, like, a uh, known communist, so, like, and that was made in, like, 2010, so, like, I still feel like people, even nowadays, like, in college, like, you can joke about capitalism, but, like, nobody really cares. Yeah, kind of. I mean, that's that, that's why I say it does seem kind of, like, sterile sometimes, because people talk about these things, but there's no real, like, action that comes out of it, or even, you know, a movie like, uh, you know, like Parasite is a good example, which won the Academy Award. You know, first first foreign movie to win the you know Academy Award for best uh, you know picture deals with class issues. You you could say in in a in a certain fashion at least. Um, so yeah, people love you know upper and, and it is a strange thing. Like you said, people who 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 sort of you know benefit from capitalism or sort of live a privileged life under capitalism are the ones who oftentimes talk about these themes of alienation and dehumanization and things like that. Um, and and I guess yeah to a, to a large extent I do kind of feel like there there is a lot of you know posing and posturing that goes along with this it's 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 a lot of talk but not a lot of action um, yeah did you want to say something else oh yeah just one more thing also like in order to even be aware of these things you have to have privilege to like afford ed- education you know like you can't just well understand. yeah I mean to a certain extent I mean I mean plenty of, of working class people are aware, you know, ha- have a kind of like a visceral hatred of the experience of work under capitalism, but maybe don't have the vocabulary to, to express it, you know, to, to this level or degree that people like, you know, like Horkheimer do. Um, and I think, you know, in many ways that, that seems to be maybe one way in which things should, sh- should go. But w- w- what, I'm, what I'm also talking about is that, you know, the same people that talk about themes of alienation and things like that in modern culture are the same people who will, you know, tell you, you know, vote blue no matter who and vote for the lesser of two evils. And they'll say, you know, healthcare is a human right, but then they'll vote for the guy who literally said that he would, you know, veto Medicare for all and things like that. So I'm just not that impressed with the revolutionary credentials of people like this. It it does seem it's, it's, it's a whole lot of talk. And you know, I guess I can say this because, you know, I, I mean, I may seem like an intellectual person. I like to think of myself as that, certainly. But you know, you know, I also don't see myself as being very comfortably middle class either. Like, you know, you know, like many people, it is more of a struggle to get by the, these days, certainly than it was, you know, in the prior decade. So um, not to say that, pe- you know, that people don't have it, you know, a lot worse than I do. But I, I do think that there is something to that, the, the people that want to talk about these things, but then they're just, you know, content to vote for the Democratic Party. And that seems to be their, their only real sort of avenue of political action or, or you know, participation, which, which, which frankly, I think is very unimpressive. I mean, I mean, if, if that's your big, you know, radical stance, you've got to vote for Joe, you know, for Joe Biden and, and hope to push him to the left, as many people have, have, have said, well, I think we've seeing that strategy has already kind of, you know, backfired. And, and, and frankly, you know, I mentioned the, the New Yorker magazine. I, I did that for a, a reason. I mean, many of these highbrow, you know, culturally elite publications, if you go back to 2003, they were also drinking the Kool-Aid and, you know, writing articles about weapons of mass destruction and things like that. We'll, 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 we'll cover that more, you know, like I said, later on, well, uh, you know, especially when we talk more about specifically about the news media. But, but, you know, I think, yeah, between voting for, you know, the Democrats, no matter what, the fact that many of these people were, you know, going along with the drive towards war in 2003, the fact that many of these people, you know, participated in the, in the bogus, you know, Russian, you know, conspiracy, which basically, you know, dominated every aspect of news for like, you know, three or four years after Trump got elected. I I think, I think there is a, a, a fair degree opposing that goes on. I think a lot of these people just like to kind of like, you know, pretend to be radical a little bit, uh, but it doesn't really translate into real, any kind of real radical political action. At least that's my take on it. 
Um, and, you know, in, in many ways, like, like I said, you know, going back to Horkheimer, I mean, Horkheimer and his ilk and his brethren kind of, in many ways, sort of initiate this, 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 you know, path, which, which, you know, has sort of, uh, you know, which we're sort of on now. And I, it's not to say that, you know, if Horkheimer was, was around, he would have supported the war in Iraq. I mean, you know, obviously I can't an answer that for sure. But um, certainly, you know, the people, like I said, that, 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 that do kind of talk about this and do kind of have internalized this kind of writing and stuff, they, they very much are kind of part of that, you know, social mil milieu and stuff. And, uh, you know, the New York Review of Books is another one. I remember, you know, they're, they're another one that kind of tries to brand itself as being sort of like a radical publication and stuff. I remember reading an article from them in, you know, 2020, just, you know, like gushing over like Andrew Cuomo and stuff. It's, it's like, it's very, you know, they, 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 it, it seems very much lacking when, when it comes time to like, you know, actually making a political choice or having some kind of, you know, political instinct or political judgment or something like that. So I'll, I'll just kind of leave it at that and then kind of move on unless anyone else wants to comment on that. I mean, I think it is an interesting idea. It's a very sort of, you know, paradoxical tendency of modern life. The people who, who sort of, you know, embrace or internalize all this like radical language oftentimes come from a very sort of, you know, like you said, very, you know, privileged and, you know, contented and complacent, I would say, you know, upper uh, middle class. Um, all right. So anyway, so in this essay, Horkheimer examines, examines the differences between what he calls traditional theory and critical theory, which I said, you know, this is what the class is called. Uh, he more or less, you know, coin, coins the term here. Um, uh, you know, this is still a very highly, you know, relevant concern, as, as I think that most academic research, at least in the United States, still conforms for the, for the most part to what Horkheimer would call traditional theory. Uh, so for example, and I've, I've mentioned this, you know, before a little bit, as well in other, other classes. Political science in, in the United States is mostly based around, you know, still to, to this day, but based around, you know, quantitative methods and its theory or, or what Horkheimer calls, you know, basically sort of stored up or accumulated knowledge is also based on the results of quantitative research. So most political science, obviously this, you know, this is true for, you know, economics as well. It's true for sociology to a large extent. Um, it's even true, you know, I, I guess you could say even psychology, right? I mean, a lot of psychology today is less about, you know, what Freud called the, the, the talking cure, you know, the people who sit on the couch and, 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 and talk and supposed to sort of, you know, get into their unconsciousness that way, as it is basically become pharmacology, which is just, you know, a doctor prescribing a certain, you know, milligrams of uh, an antidepressant or something like that. So even that, in a sense, is quantitative. So, yeah, I would say what Horkheimer, you know, is arguing back in the 1930s is still mostly true today, which is that quantitative methods, a, a sort of quantitative approach to knowledge and theory, particularly in the social sciences, is still the predominant approach. And again, this is, you know, probably even more true in the United States than it is in a lot of, a lot of other countries. Um, so for, you know, for example, in, 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 in the 1950s and the 1960s, and probably also from, for some time after that, you know, most of the, you know, sort of high ranking political scientists in, in the United States, uh, you know, insisted that there was no such thing as a ruling class or ruling elite. In the United States, uh, you know, for example, you can look at the d debate between the political scientist Robert Dahl, who was for many years, you know, considered to be the sort of most, you know, esteemed, um, you know, theorist in the field, and the sociologist C. Wright Mills, who who, who wrote a very, you know, uh, important book in the 1950s called *The Power Elite*, where he argues there is a kind of ruling elite, not necessarily a ruling class, but a ruling elite made up of the top-ranking, you know, corporate executives. And political bureaucrats and military officials and and things like that. Uh, this provoked a very fierce debate. Um, Mills was a sociologist, and many sociologists tended to go more in that in that in that direction. Uh, but most political scientists, and you know, and, and it's not exactly the I would say a proud moment for 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 you know political science in the United States. 
ten, you know, tenants who insisted there was no such thing as, as a ruling class or ruling elite, which I think now can, you know, I, I, would, I would think it'd be very hard to argue against that, that there is, a, a, of course, a kind of ruling group of people um, that, you know, political power in, in this country is not, of course, widely uh, distributed, that it, it, it does tend to be sort of concentrated at, at, at the top. Membership in this ruling elite may change over time. It's not always the same amount of people, but or, or, or the same people. But uh, the way in which you sort of gain access to to this ruling elite is also very much very rigid as well, which you know normally you know requires going to the right universities and making the right kind of you know social contacts and social connections and things like that. So you know not the finest moment I would say for political scientists in, in, in the United States it makes them almost seem like propagandists, you know, for, for the, for the United States, that they're basically telling you that there is no ruling elite when, you know, in fact, there is uh, many also for many years, you know, insisted, uh, again, this is a point of uh, something else I've also brought up, you know, before that capitalism and democracy go, go together and sort of exist in this kind of harmonious relationship. Not that it's actually a, contradictory relationship between the two, that, that, that a political system that favors majoritarian rule and an economic system which favors elite rule uh, obviously are and antagonistic to each other. Uh, Milton Friedman, um, yes, Milton Friedman, yes, it was, was one of those people that was making, making that argument. Um, again, you know, he's an economist in, in, in the realm of political science, science, people like Seymour Martin Lipset, uh, Walt Rostow, who were you know very notable people in the in in the field at, at that time, also made you know very similar arguments to that. But yeah, Milton Friedman certainly be another good example. Um, you know that that relationship now is much harder to maintain. Obviously, we, we have examples of of you know authoritarian capitalism, as some people like to call it, or state or state capitalism. Uh, though many still insist that democratic in institutions are beneficial for economic growth. Uh, for example, um, the writers, um, was it Darren Asimolu and James Robinson have written, you know, several books, uh, why, why Nations Fail, um, Economic Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy, very, very important texts in, again, in, in the field of political science. You'll, 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 you'll see them you know, mentioned in almost every, you know, political science textbook and things like that. And they still basically make this argument that, yeah, democracy is beneficial for economic growth. Well, you know, except there are examples that would, you know, seem to clearly co contradict that. And most, you know, political scientists, even to, to this very day, and, and again, this is much more a tendency in, in the United States, I would say, still tend to very neatly divide the world into democratic non-democratic regimes. Of all the countries in the world, you know, you can more or less categorize them into one or you know, in, into one, one of these categories, uh, which I think is somewhat problematic. Not, not necessarily that, that, that the regimes or, or the governments, you know, if you will, that are considered to be non-democratic uh, don't earn that designation. But I think there is, you know, some definitely a problematic idea in asserting that the so-called democratic regimes really are all that democratic, including the United States. Um, so what you see here in, 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 in American political science is a tendency uh, to rely very much on quantitative methods, you know, to reduce everything to numbers and statistics. And if not that, to, to, to rely on a kind of formalism, to, to, to rely on very sort of formal criteria for things that oftentimes lack a kind of substance to them or lack any real substance to them. Like, for example, the concept of democracy. So democracy is simply defined as a political system where you have more than one political party, which obviously would, you know, already exclude the, the one party, uh, you know, socialist governments or so-called socialist governments. Um, you have, you know, representative institutions and you allow everybody to vote. So those are those are uh, uh, again f formal formal criteria. So formally speaking, of course, the United States has those features, at least you know in name, at least. But I think it's the you know so-called substance of democracy that seems to be very much missing. And we have a two-party system in name, 
but are the two parties really all that different from each other? Not really, not, not in ways that are important, I would say. Um, do we have a representative system of government? Well, yeah, we do. But does it actually represent people in, in this country? Does it actually represent the majority will? Well, no, not really. I mean, not at least according to most you know, public opinion polls and things like that, which is itself you know, a quantitative thing. You know, to to you know, say like you know, fifty six percent of Americans support this, and you know, forty four percent support that, and things like that. Um, we we again, in in theory or in in name, allow everyone the right to vote, except for people that are you know incarcerated who who very often lose their right to vote, even if they're you know no longer in prison in in many states. And of course, there are all sorts of you know voter suppression laws. We, we make it incredibly hard for people to vote. There are not enough polling locations open. So, you know, people oftentimes, you know, wait hours in line to cast a vote and things like that. So, yeah, I, I mean, formally speaking, as, as a matter of formality, in other words, we have democratic institutions, but they all seem to be, you know, on closer inspection, either dysfunctional in some ways or, or, or kind of, you know, hollow or empty. And, 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 and it's the substance that, that seems to be lacking. So, so many of these characteristics, again, a tendency to rely on formalism or formalities, a tendency to reduce everything to numbers or quantitative methods, many of those things uh, you know, fall under you know, the rubric of, of what Horkheimer calls traditional theory. And I would say you know, in, in that way, what Horkheimer is talking about is, like I said, very, still very relevant in the present day. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit more. So let's 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 dive a little bit deeper. And and I, I didn't say this yet, but um, you know, given given the structure of the class, the, the way the class is set up, you know, I'll probably spend try to spend this class talking about traditional theory and what Horkheimer's issues are with it, and then and then basically spend the next class talking about his 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 idea of critical theory. So roughly covering about you know you know the first half of the essay or so. Um, okay, so. Horkheimer does talk about, you know, what, what sort of goes into the sort of traditional approach to theory. How, how do we, you know, obtain knowledge of the world? Uh, and although he doesn't really go, go this much into detail, most of the time, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about two, two main, you know, ways of reasoning about things, right, which we call deduction and induction. As it says here, as this helpful little chart here shows you. Uh, so, Deductive reasoning basically begins from theory and sort of works its way down. You, 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 you start with a kind of theoretical, you know, a sort of belief or a principle about, about the world that you believe to be true. You formulate a hypothesis based upon that. You perform an experiment. You observe things that, that, that may support or contradict the theory. And then basically you report the results of your experiment. Um, and, and, you know, associated with Aristotle's, as, as it says here, but obviously it's much more widely, you know, shared than that. It's not, it's not like Aristotle's own unique approach to things. Although Aristotle, of course, would be one, pe one of the people who, you know, really sort of emphasizes a deductive approach uh, to knowledge. The, the sort of opposing view is induction, which kind of works in, in, in a sense, kind of almost like backwards. You start from empirical observation of things, you observe things in nature, you find a kind of pattern to these ob observations. You formulate a hypothesis about that, and then you 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 then cr create a theory around that. And I guess this is associated with Sherlock Holmes, who was a master of inductive reasoning. Right? He could he could see a stain on your shirt and figure out not only what what you ate, but what restaurant you ate it in, and you know what time of the day. You know, based on the. <laughs> How long the stain has been there, and thing, things like that. So, so, so that ability to to sort of observe things in in the world and then formulate knowledge based upon that is is, is sort of the basis of inductive reason. So, if you could simplify that a little bit more, I, I would say that de deductive reasoning is really about theory testing. You're, you're you're sort of testing out theories by sort of you know, performing experiments on them to see, you know, again, if the experiment, you know, confirms or contradicts the theory, whereas induction is more about theory building. You sort of start from sort of, you know, empirical examples and sort of create a theory based out of that, based out of your observations. And they're not that 
distinct, right? I mean, oftentimes these things sort of go hand in hand, but it's just it's it's just one way of sort of you know art, articulating you know how how this process kind of works. Um, oftentimes, inductive reasoning, you know, like I said, kind of theory building or theory creating can then be used in another example in a deductive way where you then sort of then test that theory in a, in a sort of, you know, future, future circumstance. There's also, I won't spend too much time talking about it, but just to be very, very thorough, there's also a third category known as abduction, not kidnapping. <laughs> I don't know why it's called that or abductive reasoning, which is, which is kind of, you know, I, I, I won't spend too much time talking about it, but it's kind of like a combination of deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. Um, it's a little less certain than deduction. It's more you 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 sort of formulate a theory and 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 rather than than coming to a, a conclusive proof, like deductive reasoning seeks to do, it's more of a best guess or a most likely kind of scenario. And this is one sort of example here. Uh, you know, I just want to put it out there just just to be thorough. But I think you know for for the most part, we'll just talk about deduction and induction uh, as, as they seem to be more distinct from from each other again abduction seems to be more of like a almost like a combination of the two and is thus less uh less distinct than the other two but then you also have the problem of where does knowledge come from so we 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 have this theory that we're testing in deductive reasoning where does that theory come from how do we get to that theory in the first place or the problem with inductive reasoning is that we're building theories, but what are we doing before we're, before we've arrived at a theory? Are we, are we somehow outside the realm of theory? Are we outside the realm of knowledge? Are we just you know, experiencing the world in a sort of pure, unmediated way? That doesn't seem to be the case. So really there's the question of where knowledge comes from and, 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 Specifically, also, how, how can we have knowledge about things that don't necessarily rest upon ob observation? How can we have knowledge of things that are mathematical, for example, or abstract, or things that are not directly accessible to our senses? So here we have to introduce another pair of concepts, um, a priori and a posteriori. Um, and again, you know, Horkheimer talks a little bit about Descartes in the beginning, who, of course, is a very sort of important philosopher, I think, therefore I am. Um, Descartes is very much in the tradition of what is often referred to as rationalist thinking, in that he's more concerned with forming knowledge about things that are not based upon direct empirical ob ob observation. So in, in, in many ways, they kind of contrast towards empiricism, towards this idea that we're going to observe things and then sort of build knowledge out of our observations. Uh, Descartes favors more of a deductive approach, but a deductive approach that is tested not based upon, again, performing experiments on the physical world, but based upon coming to, you know, conclusions about things that are true, but again, not, not based upon our senses. So I'll try to elaborate on this a little bit more as it's probably fairly confusing. So anyway, a... Um, a posteriori knowledge is knowledge obtained through experience, like I just said. A priori knowledge is knowledge obtained by analyzing concepts independent of experience. Uh, again, just to elaborate on a, a little bit further, a priori knowledge knowledge is knowledge that is not based upon not based on observation of the physical world. The term a priori comes from two Latin words: a means from, and priori means that which comes before. In other words, that which comes before, um, you know experience. Again, as it says, a priori knowledge is knowledge that exists in the mind before any experience with or observation of the physical world. Uh, whereas again, a posteriori knowledge, knowledge on the other hand is knowledge that comes directly from observation of the physical world. The, ter the term a posteriori means from what comes later, and that refers to knowledge that comes as a result of experiencing the physical world. Now, again, both of these approaches to knowledge fall under what Horkheimer calls traditional theory. So we're still just dealing with traditional theory 
Uh, so again, he talks a lot about well, not not a lot, but he makes some some mention to Descartes at the beginning of of, of the essay. But then later on in the essay, he talks about Immanuel Kant, and Kant, I think, also sort of builds on Descartes' sort of deductive approach, deductive a priori approach to to knowledge, and I think really sort of brings it to another level, really sort of elaborates up, up, upon that even 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 further. And Kant is also concerned with the idea of how we come how we base our observations of things, how we, how we come to have empirical knowledge of the world as, as, as well. So what Kant is trying to do, and who was a very important philosopher, if you've never heard of him before, um, also a German philosopher as well, um, he's uh, essentially trying to sort of bridge this gap between deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning, between a priori knowledge and a posteriori knowledge. Um, whether or not he's successful or not, it, you know, is another question, but, but it's a very sort of ambitious a attempt at doing so, uh, which I'll try to elaborate a little bit on, just, just because Horkheimer does, does spend some time talking about it, and, and, and Kant is a very important, important thinker. Uh, much like trying to, you know, summarize, summarize Marx's Capital, which is a massive work, you know, summarizing Kant's work, which really unfolds in, in the book known as Critique of Pure Reason, obviously is a very large undertaking, so I can only, you know, really kind of scratch the surface of what it's about, but hopefully I can at least do that and, and give a kind of, you know, general sort of overview of what he's talking about. And of course, obviously how this relates to um, Horkheimer. So Kant is also trying to, again, much like Descartes, is interested in deductive reasoning, um, but deductive reasoning that is not based upon you know, actual experience or, or, or actual, you know, observation of, 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 of the physical world. And what he's trying to set out to, to understand here is how, how we come to have knowledge of, of the world. How does our minds essentially process knowledge and, 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 and make the world understandable to us? And he argues basically that there is a, a, a kind of active component to our consciousness, that our minds don't just sort of passively record data, like a microphone or a camera or something like that, but that there is a, a kind of active component to our minds that essentially kind of filters and processes and makes sense of this kind of sense, sensory data that's coming at us. Um, so like I said, I, I, I like to think of it as a kind of an active component to our consciousness, that, that our consciousness is not passive, but active in understanding the world. I think another way the, the, that you could look at it is that um, our experience of reality is, 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 is always an interpretation, right? That, that we don't ever actually get to experience the world as it actually is, but we, we're always in a sense kind of interpreting the world around us through, through our you know, processing of, of various sensory data. Um, which I think is a very, you know, important, important insight. Um, you know, Kant is, and this is something that, that Horkheimer will, will, will criticize him for, Kant is, is much less concerned with understanding the social world and, you know, history and, 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 and the kind of the, the social relationships that, that exist between people. Um, I'm much more interested in that than, than I am in, in this, to be honest. You know, but I think it is, you know, important insights to, to, to try to understand, uh, obviously, how our minds work and how we try to, you know, process the world around us. But it is interesting to point, point that out, that that is something that seems to be lacking in Kant. As thorough and rigorous and detailed as Kant is in trying to understand how our minds process knowledge, it is almost strange that he seems almost unconcerned with understanding the social world, with understanding how people sort of relate to the social world around them. So, you know, Kant is also basically dealing with, again, one of the problems of inductive reasoning as well, which is this idea that we start from observation and, so, and then sort of build our way up to knowledge of the world, build our way up to theories. The problem with that, though, again, is this idea that, you know, what are we doing before we have a theory? Are we somehow, when we're just observing the world, are we in this pre-theoretical space? Are we, are we somehow, you know, outside of the, the world of knowledge? Are we, are we, you know, again, you know, taking in the, in, in, in the world in a, in a, in a, in a direct unfiltered way? Kant would say, no, of course not. We, 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 our minds are always sort of active. There's always this kind of theoretical uh, 
aspect going on in, in our minds in, in the way in, in which we, 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 we process the world around us. So kind of in a very large undertaking tries to deductively argue how we how our minds work and 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 how we come to organize our our sort of you know experiences of the world and this leads to one of his most you know important ideas which is what is referred to as the categories of the understanding or the categories of the pure understanding so again these are things that are not based upon experience these are things that are based upon sort of the structures of the mind which again are not really accessible to direct experience. We can't we can't see these things at play. We can't observe them at play. But Kant would argue, logically speaking, that these things must work, or these things must be operating in, in order for us to to make sense of the world. And again, how exactly he he argues that, and how exactly he comes up with that conclusion, uh, you know, is, is is somewhat you know beyond the scope of of, of this class, or it really can't be easily explained without you know going in depth in, in, into what he's talking about, you know, in, in a book that's several hundred, pa several hundred pages long. But I kind of at least kind of summarize the conclusions that he gets to. So he argues that we, that, that these categories or that these parts of our mind are in operation and allow us basically to understand the world. And he says, you know, it starts off fairly simple. He says there's basically four, four main categories, <laughs> quantity, quality, relation, and modality. But then he divides them up into basically 12, that they that each each of the four basically has sort of three different subdivisions to them. So quantity has unity, which, of course, you know, everything is one plurality. Um, things are many and distinct and totality, which is that, you know, everything is a part of one thing that they may be separate, but there's sort of like an underlying unity between these things. Then you go to quality. There's reality. Something is either real or it's not real. Negation, again, the disproving of reality, saying something is, is in fact not real. Limitation, which basically says that, you know, things exist, but under a certain circumstances, basically. Then there's relation. So how do you know how do one ob, how do objects relate to each each other? Well, they're inherent, meaning that they are you know that it's within itself basically. Or there's a relation of causality; one thing causes another thing. There's a correlation, so that they're separate, but that they're again also sort of connected to each other. And then there's what he refers to as modality, uh, which means you know how do we you know, what, what, what are the conditions under where something exists? So it's either a possibility, it might exist, might not, we're not sure. Necessity, it has to exist, it must exist. Contingency, it might exist under certain circumstances. Again, we don't have to go so much into, 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 into detail in explaining this. Um, you know, I mean, I could certainly try to explain if, if, if any of it is relatively unclear. I, I don't imagine it's perfectly clear, but let's just kind of go along for the ride for now at least this is this is basically what he's saying he's, he, he's saying that our mind that these are again structures basically within our mind and it's the way we again we sort of again interpret the world and sort of make sense of the world around us that if we didn't have these things that the, the world would be incomprehensible if we weren't able to distinguish between quant, you know quantity quality relation and modality we wouldn't be able to perceive anything he would say okay i hope that that part at least is, is clear See anything in the chat? Okay, nothing in the chat. <laughs> so then it gets a little more complex from there. So then uh, when he's talking, so you, you can see in the you know middle um, column here basically refers to what we were just talking about: quantity, quality, quantity, quality, relation, modality, you know, unity, plural, plurality, to totality, reality, negation, limitation, and so on. Um, so that's what he's calling a priori, right? So these are the things that exist, but are not dependent upon observation. We can't observe these things. But again, Kant would argue that logically speaking, these things must be a, a part of our mind, must be a part of how we interpret the world. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to interpret anything. So he says. But then he goes further and tries to connect that to a posteriori. In other words, argues that these things are also sort of operating or come into play when we are making empirical observations about the world. 
So in, in that sense, he's trying to connect, again, both a priori and a posteriori, that there are things that exist, that there, there, there are things that are logically speaking true, but they're not based upon our experience of things. But when we do observe things that exist, we're also sort of bringing these principles into play. And that is, I think, the easiest way to under, understand it. You can then see, so when he says categories of understanding, again, he's talking about a priori, what is, what, what, what is prior to experience. When he's talking about what he calls the function of thought in judgment, he's talking about how these principles play out in the empirical world. And he's also then, in the other <laughs> column here, talking about how this sort of like builds up in, in, into higher levels of perception. So you see, he starts with axioms of intuition, sort of the most basic, you know, elements of perception, anticipations of perception, analogies of experience, and postulates of empirical thought in general, which is sort of like the highest level. Anyway, I hope I'm not losing anyone here. I, you know, again, this is complicated, but this is also kind of building the case, which 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 Horkheimer says, right? Which is that Kant spends so much time talking about this. Yet he seems almost completely unconcerned with things that are actually going on in the social world, the world that's sort of you know conditioned by history and changed throughout, throughout throughout history. It's it's almost amazing that he could be so thorough in the one area and seem almost relatively unconcerned with with, with the other aspects of life. Um, but again, this is the again the way in which he he tries to kind of uh, you know br bridge the gap essentially between these two things. And and uh, again, you can see that the the, the the relationship between the two are fairly similar. Unity becomes universal, plurality becomes particular, totality becomes singular. Again, that which is sort of all encompassing, you know, reality becomes affirmative. So something that's real, you, you can, you know, essentially, you know, affirm that it exists. Negation and the negative, it doesn't exist. Limitation and infinite. Um, now that also one seems a little more paradoxical in the sense that um, when you're talking about lim limitations, you're obviously talking about something that's finite. Um, what, what, what Kant is saying is that, you know, in the real world, you know, judgments about what's actually infinite are, are more or less beyond our, our comprehension. There, there may, in fact, in theory, be things that are in infinite, as, you know, many people would, would, would argue, I, I suppose, but our actual perceptions of, the, of these things are always going to be based on, upon some kind of limitation or some kind of finite nature and 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 and, and you know it goes on from there i mean i'm not going to ex explain all of it other than the fact that again this is how he tries to connect what is sort of prior to experience to what is actually you know a part of our experience and again basically what is um you know how he tries to essentially you know bridge, bridge the gap between how our minds function and how our minds actually perceive the world so Kant lays out a lot of limitations, as, as, I, already said, as I already said, you know, reality is essentially an in interpretation, which means that we never get to really experience the world as it really exists. Now, Kant believes that there is a, a, a quote unquote real world that exists outside of us, but that we will we'll never really get to experience it. And we'll always be sort of based upon our, what he calls our intuitions of the appearance of, of, of the world. So essentially our knowledge is based upon appearances of things, not the so-called thing in itself, as, as, he, as he famously says. Um, but related to this idea of, of setting limitations upon our knowledge, Kant is saying, you know, basically saying that this is where the limits of our knowledge lie. Don't, don't go beyond this level, basically. Don't try to go beyond the level of appearance. Be happy, essentially, that you can even have a more or less accurate judgment of the appearance of things. You know, and again, not all judgments of appearances are the same. Some people will be able to better judge the appearance of the appearances of things better than other other people, but nobody ever gets a, a sort of direct, unfiltered access to the world itself. Now, Kant does sort of deal with the issue of what happens when you try to sort of cross that boundary that he sort of sets out for you. And this actually is sometimes referred to as antinomies or sort of like anti-knowledge basically, but also is often referred to as the dialectic in, in Kant's theory, sometimes known as the, by the somewhat more confusing term, the transcendental 
dialectic. Uh, the transcendental is Kant's word for sort of, you know, going outside, you know, the realm of experience. Um, but again, since we've talked about the, the, the idea of the dialectic before, it is, I think, important to, to, to you know, at least spend a little time talking about how, how, how the dialectic sort of plays out in, in Kant's vision, I think. So if you, in Kant's uh, philosophy. So if you remember, you know, the term dialectic refers to sort of the interaction between in, in, uh, incompatible things. Now, in Marx's terms, it's a materialist dialectic. So it's, it's, it's the interaction between things in the material world, in the, in the physical world, which are incompatible with each other. But originally the term dialectic referred to ideas, which are incompatible with, with each other. And Kant sort of lays out basically four sets of ideas, which he argues are incompatible. And there's no real clear way to resolve these ideas. And this is essentially what he says, essentially this is what happens when you sort of cross over the boundaries of reason, when you cross over the boundaries of, of what is possible to understand about the world. So for example, um, one, one idea would hold that the, the world, you know, specifically as to time and space has a beginning. There is a point in time where the world begins, where the universe begins, you could say. Um, other people would say that there is, is no beginning point, that the, wor the, the, the world or the universe maybe is more accurate way to say it is, is essentially infinite, that there is no beginning point to time, there is no beginning point to space. Both these ideas seem, at first glance at least, to be more or less plausible. Um, Kant would say that there is no way to determine this, that, that, that both ideas essentially are false um, because... Um, to do so, you, you, you would have to be able to sort of experience the universe or, uh, as, as a whole or have some, some experience of, of, of the universe. And of course, that's just simply, simply not possible. So in other words, you cannot really say whether or not the world, you know, at least this is what he says, that the, 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 the world actually has or does not have a beginning point. Um, okay. Uh, everything, you know, the, the next set of ideas. Everything in the world consists of elements that are simple. In other words, everything is, is more or less one thing. Uh, the opposing idea, again, there is no simple thing. Everything is composite. Everything is sort of different and uh, distinct. So again, Kant would say there is no way to really resolve this idea. Um, things are objects of experience. Again, you can't, you know, have an experience that, 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 that would tell you whether or not everything is one thing or everything is separate. Okay. The third one, and probably the one that people probably talk about the most, maybe, maybe, you know, aside from whether or not, you know, the universe, you know, has a beginning point in time and space, uh, the, the notion of free will, right? There are, there are, are in the world causes through freedom. In other words, the people sort of act on their own spontaneous will and are free to choose what they want, basically, or free to do what, what they want. Uh, the, the opposing idea to this, again, is that there is no freedom. Everything is sort of predetermined and sort of planned out in, in advance, or at least happens through the sort of almost mechanical, uh, you know, interaction of natural laws. So in, 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 in that sense, we, we don't have any free will, that all of our actions are sort of determined by prior causes. Again, Kant says there is no way to, you know, resolve this issue. Although he, he, he does try to, in, in some of his later writings, try to resolve this issue of free will versus, you know, a, a prior cause for, for everything. Although people would also argue that that is, is highly problematic as, as well. When, when, when Kant tries to deal with the, the issue of freedom and morality and things like that. And then again, anyway, and the final one, in, 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 in the series of world causes, there is some necessary being, i.e. God. That there is a supreme being which basically, you know, created the whole world and the universe. I guess this would also be an, an, another question, obviously, that people, uh, you know, ponder a lot. And again, the opposing idea, there is no supreme being. There is no, you know, divine creator in the world. The world is just a bunch of, you know, series of random events and things like that. So these are obviously questions that people do often ponder or question or debate about. Kant, Kant's approach is, is essentially <laughs> don't ask these questions. You know, this, this is sort of beyond the scope of reason. This is really sort of beyond the ability of what we're, we're capable of, of, of even knowing. 
Um, and so we should just sort of leave it alone. Don't, don't uh, essentially, like I said, don't even try to ask these questions is basically what he says. Now, obviously that's not a very satisfactory answer for a lot of people. And it's interesting that many philosophers after Kant, you know, beginning in Kant's own lifetime, tried to sort of pick up this, this, this issue, including the philosopher Hegel, who's again, you know, now probably like the third or fourth time I'm mentioning now. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about him more next class, because I think in many ways Hegel could be considered, in many ways, maybe the first critical theorist. Um, but suffice to say, for now, what, what, what Hegel essentially tries to do is to kind of add a social and historical dimension to what Kant is talking about. So everything that Kant is saying essentially is sort of outside the realm of society. For Kant, this is just how the mind works. This is how the mind always works, always has, and always will. So whether it's you know a caveman or you're dealing with a modern day person, their mind more or less functions and operates the, the same way. What Hegel says, what Hegel asks this is that, well, no, actually there is kind of a historical aspect to this that the way the, the mind functions and operates has actually changed historically over time. The way in which people perceive the world historically has changed over time, which I think is a very interesting idea and a very profound thought in its own right. And in that regard, like I said, Hegel tries to finally sort of break through this barrier and really kind of add a social and historical um, you know, dimension to things, which I think in many ways is, is kind of like the starting point for critical theory. I mean, I mean, this is what Horkheimer says, right? Is, is that that's what's lacking in Kant's philosophy is that it's, it's what, what, what they would call a historical or meaning it's, it's sort of, you know, outside the realm of history. It, it, it doesn't take into consideration the, the various sort of social forces which are playing against people. Another aspect to, to, to consider, which is important is that some people, again, in, in Kant's own day, charged him with, the idea of nihilism, that the Kant's philosophy essentially leads to nihilism, which is essentially a, a uh, you know, it's a tough term to, to define, but, you know, so you could say it's, it's the absence of belief, or it's the belief that nothing is real, or that nothing is at least certain, uh, that you're, in, in a sense, you know, very skeptical of everything. It is kind of an interesting idea, and it does, it, Kant does seem to sort of set himself up for that kind of of criticism, because when he says that all we can have are is 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 knowledge of the appearances of things, in a sense, what he's saying that you know none of the stuff is really is is real. It's it's almost like a kind of relativistic argument that 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 our perception of reality is our own, and that basically you know we can't ever be more certain of anything other than that. Well, if that's true, then then how you know how can we be certain of anything? How do we know that not everything that we believe isn't just false or you know distorted in in some ways? So so that's also kind of a criticism that 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 Hegel and other people would take up that 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 there are still some sort of lingering problems within you know Kant's approach to things that has to be sort of explored more. All right, my I'm gonna sw switch off the uh, PowerPoint for a second just so I can check the time because I don't know where. We are. Wow. It's almost, uh, my clock is like five minutes fast. So it's like one twenty already. Okay. <laughs> so let me, uh, move here a little bit more. Uh, spent so much time talking about Kant, of course. But now we finally get to Horkheimer himself. So as he says, theory is dependent on Mathematics. So as he says, and, 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 and this writing actually does have page numbers, so I include them here. As he says on page 190, uh, insofar as the um, traditional conception of theory shows a tendency, it is towards a purely mathematical system of symbols. As elements of the theory, as components of the propositions and conclusions, there are ever fewer names of experiential objects and ever more numerous mathematical symbols. Even the logical operations themselves have already been so rationalized that in large areas of natural science, at least theory formation has become a matter of mathematical construction. So he's saying that traditional theory tends to rely upon a, a sort of mathematical approach to, to knowledge. And I think that is true. I think that, 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 that both you know, encapsulates deductive reasoning, 
which is where if you start from, you know, even Kant or Descartes, you know, they, they base their idea of deductive knowledge on mathematical principles. That, that for them is sort of the, the model. Two plus two equals four is a deductive principle that is also, you know, not based on observation or experience or, or based on, you know, sensory information, basically, but, but it's sort of like a pure intellectual principle. So the basis of deductive knowledge, you know, particularly if it's not based upon, you know, observation of things, usually takes mathematical knowledge as sort of its starting point or sort of its foundation. Um, and, and, and for inductive approaches, again, starting from observation and then working your way up to theory, of course, in many cases, if not most cases, you're dealing with, again, quantitative forms of knowledge that, that, that you're using statistical data and, and numerical information to, to sort of base your observations on, on things. You're not just observing one thing, but you're observing usually a large set of things. And to do, and, you know, and to, uh, you know, to process that, you usually reduce it to some sort of, you know, quanti quantitative formula. So I think, you know, Horkheimer is right to say that, that traditional theory in both its forms, both its deductive form and inductive form, both heavily relies upon a, a, a sort of mathematical construction of knowledge. And that this also, you know, plays a very big role in the development of capitalism. So as he says here on, on, on the following page, um, all this adds up to a pattern which is outwardly much like the rest of life in a society dominated by industrial production techniques. Such an approach seems quite different from the formulation of abstract principles and the analysis of basic concepts by an armchair scholar, which are typical, for example, of one sector of German sociology. Yet these divergences do not signify a structural difference in ways of thinking. So again, whether or uh, not you're taking a deductive approach or an inductive approach. Sorry, let me plug in my laptop here before it goes dead. Um, in recent periods of contemporary society, the so-called human studies, Geist Wissenschaften, or in German, you know, basically the social sciences have had but a fluctuating market value and must try to imitate the more prosperous natural sciences whose practical value is beyond question. Again, very similar, you know, debate plays out now when people talk about STEM versus the arts and humanities and things like that. Um, here it also refers to the reification of theory. Uh, so again, I, I selected this passage obviously because of the reference to reification, which of course is, 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 is the theory that you know, Lukash works out. Um, so he says, the manipulation of physical nature and of specific economic and social mechanisms demand alike the amassing of a body of knowledge, such as is supplied in an ordered set of hypotheses. The technical <clears throat> advances of the bourgeois period are inseparably linked to this function of the pursuit of science. On the one hand, it may it made the facts fruitful for the kind of scientific knowledge that would have practical application in the circumstances. And on the other, it made possible the application of knowledge already uh, possessed. Beyond doubt, such work is a moment in the continuous transformation and development of the material foundations of that society. But the conception of theory was absolutized as though, as though it were grounded in the inner nature of knowledge as such, or justified in some other historical way. And thus it became a reified ideological category. All right, so what does he mean by this? What is the reference to reification? Um, essentially, again, what he's saying here, if you, if you think back to the idea of reification, is when the sort of social relationships between people, and Lukash, he, he's talking mostly about the social relationships of production, of how we produce things, are either concealed or forgotten or obscured in some way that we lose sight of the social relationships that under, underpin those things and look at production as a relationship between things, right? That the goods that are produced, um, we, we in fact enter into a social relationship with the people that are making these things, but we forget about that or it's concealed from us in many ways because, because of the, the alienation of labor. And so we look only at the thing, we, we forget about the, the people uh, uh, that, that basically make, make, that make the thing. Uh, uh, essentially what Horkheimer is talking about is that is this theory kind of goes through a, a similar thing, which is that the, the theorist or the scientist 
um, sort of loses sight from the social relationships that they're a part of. That, 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 that we forget the theory does not just come about in a vacuum, is, is not just made in this sort of pure realm of theory and science, but it is always sort of constructed and made in a, in a definite sort of social environment. Um, that's okay. Uh, have a nice day too. It's probably close to 1.30 now, so God, I don't have my phone near me. It's, uh, it's, my clock is always like five or six minutes fast, so it's, it's almost uh, 1.30. Um, I could, I guess, probably start wrapping things up here. But again, I think that's, a, that, that's an important usage of, of, of the term. This, the, you know, again, and, and I think a lot of people do often lose sight of that, right? The knowledge or theory is not created in the sort of pure space, some, somehow outside of society and sort of, you know, outside of the historical forces that basically shape people, but is always connected to that. Although, again, it's very easy to sort of lose sight of that, both from the people that are you know, in, in, in our in our terms, sort of like consuming theory or sort of consuming knowledge or making use of this knowledge, but also from the people that are producing it, the, the, the theorists and the scientists themselves, they, in, in, in some cases, lose sight of that knowledge themselves. Um, the world we experience is a product of society. All right, I think I'll just end things here because I have a lot to say about that, but I want to get cut off here. So we are, you know, we are definitely getting into the thick of things now. You know, as I've said, these are, you know, somewhat complicated readings. Um, I know Khan can be, you know, sort of, you know, confusing to un understand. Uh, like I said, you know, myself, I mean, I, I still find it perplexing sometimes. I'm, I'm much less concerned with, with things like that than I am with trying to understand how society works and how society operates. And I don't mean to show my own ignorance here, but, you know, in all fairness, you know, Khan himself doesn't seem to be that concerned with society at, at all. So, so at least there's, there's a sort of, you know, focusing on one area, maybe more, more than the other. Uh, but it is certainly, you know, you know, profound stuff. It is, it is obviously important to understand how we come to have knowledge of, of the world. I like the idea that there is a active component to our consciousness. And, and when I say I, I like it, I mean, it makes sense to me. It's, it, it seems to be true. It seems to be a good way of understanding how we have knowledge of the world, that we don't just sort of experience the, the world in this sort of direct, unfiltered way, but that our consciousness plays a very sort of important role in, in sort of, you know, organizing our experience and, and sort of making sense of it. And of course, you know, different people are, are obviously going to have different experiences of things and, 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 and different ways of sort of organizing that experience. All right, any questions then before we uh, <coughs> wrap things up? Uh, no, guess not. Okay, so then we'll just pick things up on Thursday. So take care, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, have a good day. Bye-bye. Oh, stop.